Let me begin by saying good evening, everyone, and welcome to this City of Brampton Parking Plan Virtual Engagement Session. And thank you so very much for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us. I know there are a lot of things that compete for your time and your attention and your interest in the Brampton's new comprehensive parking plan, and of course, your interest in the ongoing vibrancy and success of your community and of the city as a whole is very much appreciated. I do a fair bit of this kind of work, and it's my personal belief that people who take time out of their busy lives to participate in and to participate constructively in sessions like this one are most deserving of our gratitude and respect. So thank you again for joining us and I look forward, as I'm sure to you, to a productive and valuable session. Now, for those of you whom I've not yet met, my name is Glenn Pache. I'm the head of a firm called GLPI, and it's my pleasure to serve as the independent facilitator for tonight's meeting. So again, it might be important for you to know that I am not a City of Brampton staff member, nor am I uh, a, a, an employee of any of the transportation firms that have been retained to assist with the parking plan initiative. My role is simply to facilitate the session and the only bias I bring to the meeting, if you can call it a bias, is toward achieving the best result for us all. Now, I'll introduce a few others in a couple of minutes, but before we go any further, let me share a respectful land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that we are gathering here today, at least virtually, on the treaty territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, and before them, the, ter the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, Huron, and Wendat. We also acknowledge the many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit, and other global Indigenous people that now call Brampton their home, and we are honored to live work and enjoy this land. Okay, so what is this session all about? You'll hear more about this later, but really simply put, Brampton is in the process of developing a citywide parking plan with a view to meeting the evolving needs of the community as the city grows and as conditions change. And the plan will cover parking for automobiles, for motorcycles, bicycles, and trucks. So again, it's comprehensive in nature. And the plan will take into account the various city policies and priorities and help to realize the aspirations of Brampton's 2040 vision. Moreover, the plan will identify issues and opportunities and recommend related policies to try to address or to realize them. Now, the process has a number of components and phases, and in today's session, that is our first, so this is the inaugural, the first citywide virtual workshop on the parking plan. Our focus is on introducing the initiative and getting some of the valued community input on a number of things. And we'll talk more about those a bit later. And by the way, you can find additional information about the Brampton parking plan on the city's website. And I'll read this slowly in case you want to write it down. I think it'll be in the slides later, but it's brampton.ca forward slash parking plan. So again, that's brampton.ca forward slash parking plan. Now, we have a number of objectives for the meeting tonight, and they're reflected in the session agenda, which is as follows. And we've got a slide which we'll put up for you now. Um, next slide, please. We're obviously in the opening remarks component right now. In a moment, I'll introduce some of the team members that you'll be hearing from this evening, either as presenters of information or perhaps as responders to questions and comments that you might share. We'll also hear from city staff who have some opening observations as well that they would like to pass along. And by the way, I would like to just um, give thanks to any of our 
uh, Brampton elected officials who are joining us this evening, um, and not only for joining us this evening, but for their very much valued service to the community. It's always great to have our esteemed elected officials um, participating in these kinds of meetings. Now, I'll also provide a bit of information a little bit later about how you can participate in today's online meeting, and I'll cover a few WebEx, that is virtual meeting related housekeeping items. Then, given that this is our first meeting, we'll be inviting representatives of a firm called IBI. They are the consultants working with the City of Brampton on the parking plan. They will share an overview presentation covering a number of things, including an overview of what the parking plan is all about, why it's necessary, why it's important, the role it'll play in the city, and so forth. We'll hear about the project objectives and background and the work that's been completed to date. There'll be an overview of various contextual considerations and um, things coming out of the background document review that's been conducted. We'll hear about some of the key findings from a best practices review of parking related policies and approaches that are being used in other jurisdictions, including some of the emerging trends. And the team will also touch on parking demand, supply, and utilization. And of course, we'll discuss next steps and ways that you can continue to stay engaged in the process. And at the end of the presentation segment, and I think this is important to all of you, the team will be addressing any questions of fact or clarification on our topic. And they'll also be taking any comments you might want to share. So the project team will address as many questions as there is time for this evening, and the team commits to posting responses electronically to any questions that they don't get to verbally during the session. And we'll also, again, outline the range of opportunities that are available to you after this meeting to provide any other comments or ideas that might occur to you. Because we all know it's usually after meetings like this that we say, oh, I should have said this or I should have asked that. So again, your opportunity doesn't end at the end of this meeting. There are other avenues available to you. And of course, the city recognizes um, the importance of understanding different points of view and harnessing the best ideas from wherever they may come. So simply put, Again, I know a few of you have just joined us in progress. My name's Glenn. I'm serving as the independent facilitator. Simply put, tonight is about fostering a productive information exchange. It's about making you aware of the Brampton Parking Plan Initiative purpose and its process and the status of the initiative and work conducted to date. Um, it's about sharing next steps and about informing you of how you can continue to remain involved. Now, before we go on, just a few words about the nature of this WebEx or online session. First of all, do please note that this meeting is being recorded. And aside from um, providing a record of the session, this will also allow the city to post the recording on its website for people to watch who may not have been able to join us this evening. And for those of you who have not ever used WebEx before or who may not be that familiar with it, I'll just very briefly describe the functionality for this meeting that we'll be using later on. First of all, we will occasionally be using some real-time polling to ask you questions. And I really do hope that you will avail yourselves of the opportunity to participate. And then second, again, later in the session, not now, later in the session, we will be taking your questions and comments. And there will be two ways that you can share them. You can do so by using the chat function that is typically found on the panel, usually the bottom right side of your device. And the questions that are submitted will be put to our responder panel again, during the upcoming question and answer part of this um, session. You can also 
later on again, not now, raise your hand electronically and we'll get you into the queue to speak live. So if you would prefer to share your question or comment um, uh, orally rather than writing it in the chat, there will be that opportunity available to you as well. And I'll talk more about how to do that later on, uh, in particular for those of you who may not be familiar with the WebEx platform. Um, for everybody, though, at this point, I would just say, please be sure to remain muted until you're invited to unmute, and that'll keep the background uh, noise down while we're hearing the presentation. For those of you who have chosen to dial into the meeting, in other words, you are using a simple phone, so not a smartphone, not a computer or web-enabled device, you'll be able to listen to the presentation and you'll be able to hear me and others as, as they're speaking, but you obviously will not be able to see anything, again, if you're simply using a simple phone. You also will not be able to participate in the real-time polling or use the chat function. However, you will, you will have the opportunity to speak live. And again, more about how to do that a little bit later in the session. So again, if you have questions about anything you're hearing in the presentation, or perhaps that's not in the presentation, but related to our topic area, please hold them for later in the session. You'll have two avenues for sharing them at that point. And when you do, by the way, send questions through the chat, please address them to everyone. So you'll note if once you open the chat box that there's a little box that says send to, and you can select you know, whom it is that you want to send the messages to. I would encourage you to send them to everyone so that A, everybody on the, on the, in the meeting can see them, but also so that all of the project team members can see them and they can be thinking about them. And I'd also invite you to include your name at the end of the question um, if you would like to be so kind as to provide it. So um, the last thing I'll say again is that in the interest of openness and transparency, the chat has been set to be visible to all. So keep that in mind as well. And I know that the good people of Brampton share this next sentiment, but I'll just note that the mayor, council, and staff feel very strongly about the importance of civility and respectful dialogue. And of course, to that end, not that I would have expected this to happen, but to that end, of course, there'll be no tolerance for profanity or inappropriate language. And again, I know nobody wants that. Um, so let's take a moment to introduce the key team members that you'll be hearing from this evening, again, either as presenters of information or as potential responders to your questions and comments. And I'll invite them to just say a quick hello so that you can put a face to the name as I go through the list. And I'm going to begin with the city of Brampton. And there are a whole bunch of people who have joined us this evening from the city who are great resources. But there are two key individuals that I'll single out right now. And the first is Jeffrey Humble, who is the Manager Policy Programs and Implementation in the Planning, Building, and Economic Development Department. And Jeffrey, I know you wanted to share a few observations and perhaps introduce a few other individuals as well. Jeffrey, over to you. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you, Glenn. And um, I just uh, would maybe like to provide a little bit of background. Um, if you can see my video here. Um, so yeah, good evening and thanks everyone for attending. As Glenn indicated, I'm the manager of policy programs and implementation. And uh, this is the first of four engagement sessions we planned um, to, uh, to the end of Q4 of this year. Um, the Brampton parking plan uh, began in 2020 following council direction to identify programs and strategies to address on, on and off street parking. Uh, but this plan is not solely about addressing uh, parking supply and demand. It also aims to fulfill the uh, 2040 vision uh, to shape the future growth and transportation of the city, making Brampton a mosaic of sustainable urban places. Uh, with our new official plan on the horizon, uh, there are a range of influential factors that will shape this plan going forward. I'd just like to make a few observations. Uh, firstly, is the intensification of transit corridors along Queen Street, Ontario Street and Steeles Avenue 
where all day go service, light rail transit and bus rapid transit lines will be integrated to strategically situate major transit station areas. Uh, these mixed use communities uh, will emphasize increased transit ridership and active transportation and ser serve to reduce automobile dependency. We are seeing the shift occur in the types of development applications in the pipeline. Uh, consequently, in 2021, Council did remove some minimum parking requirements for some of these nodes and corridors. Secondly, while Brampton's growth strategy continues to build out, the remaining designated greenfield lands, such as Heritage Heights, are being planned at higher densities uh, with more of a mixed-use focus. And there's a greater emphasis, of course, on transit and active transportation. Thirdly, uh, the built-up areas of Brampton, we have a mix of low and medium density suburbs. Uh, while there is limited intensification, and from a redevelopment perspective, we are seeing intensification in the form of basement secondary suites and uh, eventually uh, the additional residential units as legislated by the province. Um, I think it's fair to say that across the, across, uh, the city, we are seeing the impacts of this in terms of on and off street parking. And lastly, uh, Glenn mentioned it's, it's not solely about um, the automobile. Uh, Brampton's uh, is strategically located in the GTA. Uh, goods movement is essential, and consequently, the city has a high concentration of trucking companies. And uh, the need for, uh, for increased truck parking has been something we've heard uh, quite clearly. And so the plan will aim to, to address that um, as well. So we're looking forward to your participation and helping us develop a, a practical and a progressive plan for, uh, for Brampton. Uh, with us tonight, I'd like to acknowledge we have our Commissioner, um, Richard Forward, our Commissioner of uh, Planning, Building and Economic Development with us, uh, as well as uh, quite, a, quite a mix of uh, staff across the city from uh, bylaw, uh, growth management and housing, uh, major transit station area planning, active transportation, long range planning, uh, Brampton official plan, integrated downtown plan, accessibility parking and others. Uh, I'd like to especially acknowledge uh, Malik uh, Majid, who um, was one of our senior policy planners who subsequent uh, council's approval uh, really got this, uh, this project off the ground. And uh, would also like to acknowledge uh, Mayor Patrick Brown and, uh, and Councillor Medeiros, our, our planning committee chair, as well as the rest of council for uh, for their support on this uh, this very important initiative moving forward. So, looking forward to uh, the discussion and the input uh, this evening, and um, and advancing this uh, very important initiative uh, with you all uh, in the coming year. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. Much appreciated. So Jeffrey mentioned Malik. Let me more formally introduce him now. Um, we have with us Malik Majid, who is a policy planner with the city, um, and he's also the project lead. But Malik, do you want to just turn on your mic and say a quick hello? Yes. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. And I think your input is going to be very important and material to the development of a very progressive uh, parking plan for Brampton. Thank Great, you. Thanks, we'll have some remarks at the end of the session. I was going to say, yeah, we'll hear again from Malik a little bit later. Thanks, Malik. And then from a firm called IBI, again, they are assisting the city with the parking plan initiative. We have four individuals whom we're going to hear from in a moment, but I'll invite them each to, again, to just say a very quick hello as I introduce them so that you can put a face to the name. We have Peter Richards, who is a director and the senior practice lead with transportation engineering. Peter? Hi, good evening, everyone. Peter Richard, project director for this. Thank you. And we have Attila Hertel, who is a transportation engineer and the consultant team project manager. Attila. Thanks, Glenn. Hi, everyone. Looking forward to discussing the parking plan with you guys tonight. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm the project manager for this study. Thanks, Attila. And we have Stefan Sang, who is a transportation engineer. Hey everyone, uh, Stefan Sang here. Really excited to talk about parking with you all tonight. And last but not least, we have Aiden Grenville, who is a transportation planner. Aiden? Hi, thanks, Glenn. Yeah, just excited to be here as well and looking forward to hearing everyone's input. Thanks. Thank you. So, given that time is of the essence, let's move to sharing some core information about the parking plan initiative. Again, covering the range of items that I mentioned earlier. And I'm going to invite Peter again and his colleagues from IBI to take us through the presentation. And as again mentioned earlier, we do 
have and we will be periodically posing some polling questions to get your thoughts on some key things. And after we hear from Peter, the team from IBI will will take us through the rest of the material. But Peter, let me hand things to you to start us off. Great, thanks Glenn. And welcome to our first public engagement session to those online and really want to thank you for taking time on this Thursday evening, but more importantly, having interest in regards to this robust progressive parking plan that uh, is taking place in Brampton. Your feedback is valuable and more importantly, it's welcomed. So as mentioned, I'm Peter Richards. I'm the project director on the IBI group side. And over the next couple of slides, I'll help get you used to our interactive tools that Glenn was talking about. And then I'll discuss the project overview and objectives. So we will be running a few polls and on the next slide, we'll start with the first one. And this is to get your feedback over the course of the presentation. We thought we'd start with a fun one to get people used to the polling mechanism. The question is, does pineapple belong on pizza? And the window should have popped up for you to vote. Uh, if I was running the poll, there would only be one button, which would be no, but I am not in charge. Um, so the poll should have popped up a new window. I just voted a, a hard uh, no on my end. And you can see the results in real time, I believe, on the chat, or I thought we could. It looks like polling has ended. Um, so we will pop up the results somewhere. Just yeah. And just the challenge, Peter, I would have been a hard yes. I like pineapple on my <laughs> pizza. <laughs> yeah, the results should be showing up anytime. So I hope if anyone has any questions, please leave them in the chat. It looks like uh, we didn't get uh, not enough people to answer, maybe perhaps due to the brevity of the poll, we had 20 people or 30% saying yes, 21% saying no, and, and almost 50% didn't answer. But that was a quick poll. We'll have a longer one because on uh, the next slide, which is not pizza related. But if anyone does have any questions, uh, please do ask them in the chat and we'll move to our first uh, more serious poll on the next slide, which is wanting to understand about you, all the, the attendees here. So I wanted to understand your relationship to the city uh, and you can select multiple, if, if multiple apply, there is resident, business owner, developer, non-governmental, non-profit organization, government or agency, city employee or others. And the poll is, should be popped up on the screen for those on computers. And we have a minute to do this and 24 seconds has passed. I thought the results popped up in real time for me. I'm not sure if it does for the, um, the city who was running the poll, but I was planning on giving a play by play. I thought, uh, I thought it did give real time uh, here, but I will just fill time for those who are voting uh, seven options here, resident, business owner, developer, non-governmental non-profit organization government agency city employee or other and you are allowed to select more than one as they apply to you poll is closing right now and the results should pop up at least for me and i will read them back to you shortly so thanks for participating in the poll good to know you know who we're speaking to who's participating and, and how that is uh, happening Results are not showing on my screen. I'm not sure if they are on Attila or Stefan's screen. Here we go. So 32% uh, of you are residents, which is about third. 1% uh, business owner, 4% developers, 1% uh, non-governmental nonprofit organization, 9% government agency, 29% city employee, and 7% other. So a lot of residents here, a lot of city employees here, and a lot of uh, government and agencies also listening in. So thank you all for taking time out on Thursday to listen to this. So on the next slide, I will go over the project overview, the parking plans, objectives, the background, and we'll get to the schedule as well. So on a high level, the parking plan will develop a forward thinking and comprehensive parking policy an implementation framework that is consistent with Brampton's planning documents, objectives, and priorities. And we'll do that with three key project objectives, which are on the next slide. And those are to 
Specifically, develop a vision and guiding principles that are consistent with provincial, regional, and municipal plans, and to address public input, one of the reasons of this uh, meeting tonight. Second one is to develop a forward-thinking citywide parking policy framework that's sensitive to Brampton's context, such as increasing intensification, multimodal transportation investments, housing affordability, and goods movement. This isn't parking specific, this is uh, broader than that. And the last one is to develop a future direction for the city's on-street and off-street parking operations, including revenue versus service goals, future capital budgets, business and financial models, performance metrics, and reporting mechanisms. Those are three of the key project objectives. I'll hand it off to my colleague, Atella to run us through our next poll. Atella. Great, thank you, Peter. As you noted, this is the third of the four interactive polling questions that we have. We should have the questionnaire popping up on your screens momentarily. Uh, for those on the, on the phone, I'll uh, read out the, the question and the different options so you're aware of it as well. The question reads, what are the most important parking issues in Brampton? And feel free to select up to, uh, up to three different options. The first option is residential parking availability, so parking in your local neighborhoods. Uh, employee parking availability and downtown parking, customer and visitor of parking availability and downtown parking, uh, unauthorized or illegal on-street parking, the cost of municipal parking, so the, the prices that you're paying for parking, uh, parking right requirements for developments as defined by the zoning bylaws, truck parking, and that could either be the availability or, or illegal truck parking going on in, in your neighborhoods, and there's also an option for other. And if you do select another, I'd like you to, to please uh, leave some comments in the chat so we're able to understand what it is uh, that you're referring to. And I'll just note everybody, Glenn here again, because people inevitably ask this. Um, IBI and the city of Brampton understand that the polls they're doing this evening are not statistically accurate or generalizable to the broader Brampton population. This is just to give you an opportunity, to give them an opportunity to get a snapshot of what those who have chosen to participate are thinking. So just wanted to make sure everybody was clear about that. And the results should be available shortly and I'll let Attila take us through. Great, Thank, thanks, Glenn. Uh, I'll also note that there's other opportunities to provide uh, feedback uh, for the parking plan. It's not just these few interactive questions that you're seeing on the screen right now. We have a couple online surveys that are available right now if you visit the project website. Uh, we've already received quite a few results from for the, the public survey, uh, so feel free to fill that out in, uh, after the meeting. So I see the results are in. Uh, the vast majority are uh, so have selected, the most popular one was, was unauthorized uh, on-street parking, so illegal parking, that's definitely good to know. The availability of uh, residential parking was 45%, which could potentially tie in with the unauthorized or illegal parking. Uh, and then the most other, the third most common one was, was uh, parking requirements for private or for developments. Next slide, please. So this, uh, this slide, I'll be discussing the project background uh, just to build upon what's already been said here today. Uh, traditionally, municipal planning has favored uh, low density land uses, which creates uh, dependencies on automobiles. Uh, this approach uh, results in uh, potential negative impacts such as urban sprawl, increased congestion, uh, additional greenhouse gas emissions with uh, increased vehicle use, uh, and in inefficiencies in the use in space. So what this means with respect to parking is that uh, we have result in an oversupply of parking when you consider citywide uh, parking supply. And as a rule of thumb, there's a, up to four parking spaces citywide for, for each vehicle, just to put it into perspective. Uh, today, uh, municipalities are, are playing cities with a shift towards intensification and promotion of alternative modes of transportation. Uh, these this includes transit, uh, cycling, walking, any other mode of transportation that's not uh, personal vehicles. And uh, with this shift, there's a promotion of or a reduction in uh, parking supply. Uh, this approach also holds true in Brampton, uh, where intensification is projected to result in a population employment growth up to about uh, 40% by 2051. And uh, with recent major investments in transit, uh, ridership has actually grown quite significantly, which is resulting in less personal vehicles on city roads and in our parking lots. Uh, given this evolving role of parking, there is now a need to assess uh, citywide parking operations, which has uh, led to this uh, Brampton parking plan. 
Next slide, please. Thank you. So on this slide, I'll be going over the schedule or the, the, plan, the progress for, for the Brampton Parking Plan. The study kicked off in September, not September, sorry, summer of 2021 uh, with a review of Brampton's existing parking policies and practices. We also took a look at the parking policies that have been adopted by municipalities similar to Brampton to give an idea, give us an idea of what's what's also uh, out there, and to give us uh, ideas of what we can potentially implement in Brampton. Uh, we'll touch on the, the findings of these uh, of these topics a little bit later on today. In the fall of 2021, we completed our review of parking supply and demand. So this will be looking at existing conditions as well as future conditions. Uh, we, we have the existing findings ready, which we'll be discussing later on today. Uh, and we've also recently started reviewing the Brampton financial plan and developing some of the strategies for improvement. Uh, the study is scheduled to be completed in the summer of this year uh, with the submission of the Brampton parking plan report. Uh, when it comes to interactions or engagement sessions with the public and stakeholders, there's going to be four rounds. This is the first of the four, uh, where we're looking to collect some feedback on existing parking issues and desired study outcomes. Uh, we'll be hosting three more throughout uh, the next several months until the September 22, when the study is completed. Uh, we'll be discussing the findings or the key findings to date, as, as well as collecting some feedback, which will be used to fine tune the study findings. Uh, next slide, please. So as I noted, uh, we'll be going through the preliminary findings for some of the, uh, the topics that we've completed to date. The first one is the background document review. Next slide, please. So the background document review uh, examines relevant policy documents and pro uh, which provides us with a foundation for the parking plan. Uh, essentially, we want to make sure that the parking plan that we develop is in line with all of uh, Brampton's other policy documents. Uh, and uh, some of the different documents that we reviewed are presented on the screen. Uh, this includes the, the uh, Brampton 2040 vision, uh, the Brampton official, pol official plan, and the transportation master plan, as well as uh, some other ones. And uh, this is not limited to Brampton plans. Uh, we had uh, reviewed regional and policy level documents as well. Uh, in general, the key finding is that uh, all of these documents support the development of a forward-thinking and comprehensive parking policy framework for Brampton. Uh, next slide, please. So more specifically for the, the background documents, uh, the review concluded that provincial, regional, and municipal planning is uh, in general shifting towards the, the support of alternative and active modes of transportation, so uh, transit, walking, and cycling, and the intensification of urban areas. Uh, when it comes to parking, as I noted before, uh, these policies translate to a redevelopment of surface parking and converting public parking to structured. This is more efficient when, it, when in terms of uh, space, which in, in intensification areas is premium. Uh, we want to minimize the on-street parking to support the development of active modes of transportation. Uh, bike lanes typically are uh, in the curbside lane, which conflicts with parking, and we want to be able to promote uh, cycling as a mode of transportation. That's not to say we're going to be removing all the on-street parking spaces, but there's a balance to be found. Uh, the other policies could be reducing parking requirements for, for private developments around major transit hubs or in the downtown core, and potentially adopting, instead of minimum parking requirements, maximum parking requirements, which limits the, the total number of parking that could be provided on site. So the, the key takeaway as I noted is to is that Brampton has a forward-looking parking policy context with a variety of plans and zoning bylaws, uh, and all of these support the move towards reducing parking and promoting sustainable modes of transportation and sustainable development forms. Next slide, please. Just wanted to walk uh, you guys through with uh, some of the negative impacts of parking. Uh, the first is. If we were to provide an abundance of parking opportunities, uh, this tends to promote the use of personal vehicles. And uh, there's a phenomenon called induced demand. Uh, essentially what that means is when, when people see that there's an abundance of available and, and cheap parking, they're more likely to select driving as a mode of transportation instead of an alternative mode, even though uh, sometimes alternative modes are, are perfectly reasonable. Uh, so this leads to increased congestion on the roads uh, sedentary lifestyles, which leads to health impacts and uh, greater greenhouse gas emissions. Parking lots are also quite large, which use, leads to an inefficient use of space, especially in intensification areas. Uh, 
the impermeable sur surfaces on parking lots uh, results in, in rainfall runoff, which can, which if they collect pollutants such as oil, can enter our waterways and contaminate contaminate ecosystems. And uh, additionally, parking surfaces could also absorb the sun heat, sun's heat, which contributes to the urban heat island effect. Next slide, please. Uh, Brampton has already started adopting some of these best practice parking policies through recent zoning bylaw updates, uh, two of which are displayed on the screen, one in 2020 and the other one in 2021. Uh, and in general, these updates promote sustainable forms of de development and transportation modes. And uh, this has already been uh, recent. Some of the, the parking minimums have already been rescinded in, in the more inten uh, intensified areas, such as the downtown core, central area, and along the here Ontario Main Street corridor. And uh, at this point, I'll pass it over to, to my colleague, Stefan, who will provide an overview of the best practices assessment. Uh, next slide. All right, thanks, Attila. Um, on the, so I'll be taking us through uh, the best practices review uh, that we have completed. Um, so this slide shows the different um, consideration areas for our best practice uh, review. Um, so we, we looked at a, a list of more than a dozen North American cities um, to include as part of this municipal review. Um, all of the strategies here are shown and these, were, these topics were selected with city staff based on areas that were identified for improvement or focus uh, as part of this uh, municipal parking strategy. And I want to emphasize that all of the content that I'm presenting and taking us through in this section are just to inform best practices and also make sure that any recommendations from this study align with uh, industry trends and, uh, and those best practices. Uh, there aren't any recommendations made for these topics yet, so I just want to make that clear before I uh, proceed. Uh, so on the next slide, um, it, it looks into the topics related to parking pricing, parking rates, and parking permits. Um, so the first topic that we'll be looking into are uh, parking pricing strategies. Uh, so these are how, um, how the city can decide um, how, what prices to set um, the parking rates at. Uh, the main principle of this is to uh, charge for parking in specific locations or at specific times that are known to have higher parking demand. So, for example, if, if uh, one street in downtown experienced very high parking demand, um, the price um, for that street could be increased. Or if there are certain times of the day, uh, maybe during uh, peak travel periods where uh, parking demand is higher, um, then that, that time would be charged higher accordingly. And the goal of this is that um, this can be used as a strategy uh, to better distribute parking demand uh, between uh, areas of high demand to um, areas of low demand. And the general principle of these uh, of the parking pricing is also to charge pricing at a rate uh, such that the user costs for those that are parking can cover expenses. Uh, so it's a self-sufficient uh, financial model. All of the costs are, are the revenues cover expenses associated with it. Another topic that we looked into uh, is looking at the uh, parking rates themselves. Uh, so right now, um, the, there can be variable rates between on-street and off-street uh, parking prices. Uh, best practice is to make uh, on-street parking more expensive compared to off-street, um, recognizing that on-street parking, you're typically closer to your uh, destination. You could be right in front of the, the restaurant or the store that you're, uh, that you're looking to travel to. So uh, you should be paying a premium uh, for uh, the proximity. And overall, um, compared to um, the other best practice municipalities that we looked into, uh, Brampton had uh, lower rates uh, than many of the comparable municipalities. And the last topic on this page uh, on the very right is looking at the parking permits themselves. Uh, in general, a lot of the, the municipalities that we looked into um, had three different types of parking permits. Uh, one is a residential permit. So if you live on, if you live in a neighborhood or if you live on a certain street, um, you need a permit to be able to park on street uh, in front of your home overnight. Uh, the other permit type is looking into the visitor permit. Uh, so this can allow you to 
uh, sign up for if you have guests visiting um, and staying overnight, you can have a limited number of uh, visitor passes that you can sign up for and print and place on the dashboard. And the last permit type that we looked into was uh, the monthly permits. Uh, so these are typically in downtown or employment areas um, that uh, employees can uh, purchase monthly parking permits uh, to park in municipal um, off-street lots. And right now, uh, Brampton has, um, has uh, the temporary visitor parking permits. Uh, the next slide looks into the, the next three topics of our review. Uh, this included parking technology, uh, parking enforcement, and parking minimums. Uh, related to parking technologies, um, there's three different aspects that we looked into. Uh, the first was looking at smart parking meters. Uh, the next was looking at park parking applications. And the last was looking at parking occupancy, tech occupancy technology. Uh, so a smart parking meter uh, is a parking meter that is connected to a uh, central management system. So this allows um, the city to uh, remotely uh, control the parking prices that are charged. Uh, you can also uh, check the historic utilization data and also how many, uh, how much revenue is, has been collected from these meters. And a benefit of these parking meters is that as the, the user can pay for these uh, can pay for a parking session using a credit card or debit card. Uh, they don't always have to have cash or coins on hand, uh, which is especially useful uh, nowadays when cash is a lot more limited. Um, the next topic that we looked into was uh, parking applications. Uh, so these are phone-based um, applications that allow users to pay through either their smartphone or by calling or texting a certain number that has a zone associated with it. Uh, within these parking apps, um, there can also be uh, a map of the parking system. So it can show you all of the available parking facilities and directions to uh, your different parking lots or on-street segments. And um, some of them, if they get more advanced, uh, they can have real-time parking occupancy technology. So this shows you um, if you're looking for uh, parking downtown, it can show you um, real time how many parking spaces are available or even which specific spaces are available. So that can really reduce the amount of uh, cruising or circling that you're doing uh, looking for a parking spot. And the last uh, topic we looked at related to parking technology was the occupancy technology. Uh, so I touched on that a little bit before. It allows the parking users and operators to view uh, parking availability and utilization uh, real time. Uh, there's uh, some municipalities that um, are using this technology to help um, determine parking pricing. Uh, so they'll look at which, um, which areas of the city are experiencing higher parking demand, and then they'll raise the parking prices there accordingly. Um, related to parking enforcement, um, a lot of municipalities, uh, including Brampton, uh, are introducing license plate recognition uh, software. Uh, so these can um, record license vehicle license plate, uh, which allowed for a lot more efficient uh, enforcement compared to traditional methods. Um, there are, uh, vehicle mounted license plate recognition cameras, which allow enforcement officers to drive around um, and patrol an area so they can cover like five to 10 more times ground uh, compared to a traditional uh, enforcement officer on foot. And then uh, the, the next topic that we're looking at uh, is for uh, parking minimums. Um, traditionally, uh, these parking minimums have been set from in the 80s and the 90s. Uh, so that's when there is a lot more auto or vehicle dependency. And that has led now to an oversupply of parking. Uh, so for every development, um, the developer is required to provide a certain rate of parking based on either your square footage or your units um, in your development that you're proposing. and. Since these minimums are a lot higher than they need to be, it can result in an oversupply of parking. Uh, this can result in um, 
and part to build the parking space is extremely expensive. It can cost like forty or fifty thousand dollars to build a parking space in a structured facility. Um, so what a lot of municipalities are looking at are to reduce or even eliminate parking minimums. Uh, this can be done on an area specific. Uh, so. Um, for example, um, Brampton is within their downtown parking. There are no minimum parking requirements other than for residential uh, uses. And there's also a few other uh, areas within Brampton, uh, the here Ontario main corridor, uh, where there um, are reduced or no parking minimums. Um, and then also, like uh, my colleague Attila touched on, um, there's also the concept of parking maximums, uh, which can be applied to a uh, state you cannot provide more than this uh, certain rate of parking just to keep um, the parking supply uh, lower uh, within the cities. Uh, the next slide here uh, shows the uh, truck parking. So this was um, identified as a, as a major focus area within Brampton um, with the knowledge that the existing truck parking supply is limited. Uh, this can be either for short-term activities, so if a truck is looking to um, is waiting to um, to load or un offload at a at a trucking or a manufacturing facility, um, and this also applies to long-term um, long-term truck parking. Uh, drivers are required to have a certain rest break. You can't drive more than a certain number of hours in a row. Uh, so there needs to be designated areas for those drivers to uh, safely and uh, conveniently stop. So through our best practice review, we identified uh, several different uh, truck parking uh, best practices, uh, which I'll quickly take us through. Um, so the first one is looking into the shared parking lots. Um, these can consist of uh, existing park and ride lots or carpool lots uh, normally for um, during the daytime is used by commuters, uh, but overnight parking is essentially empty. Uh, so this is an opportunity for uh, long term overnight truck parking um, that the we can make use of these existing facilities um, when the demand is low for other uses. Uh, other things that we're looking into uh, were for industrial areas, uh, both on street and off street. Um, what other cities have done is to permit on site parking in areas that are zoned for industrial uses. Um, other municipalities have looked into um, redeveloping brownfield sites. Uh, so these are former industrial sites where it might not be appropriate uh, for certain. Uh, commercial or residential uses, it might be contaminated, um, but it can still be appropriate for uh, truck parking uses. Uh, another topic was looking into the off-peak use of large venues. Uh, this is very similar to the shared lots, uh, just understanding when uh, the peak demand times exist and um, if it's not being used when uh, the trucking, when truck drivers would be looking to use it, then there's an opportunity to um, allow truck drivers to park there for longer term. Um, some other municipalities have implemented a truck parking availability system. Uh, this is similar to the occupancy technology that I discussed before, um, but this is at truck stops or trucking facilities, and it can tell truck drivers um, that there are, say, 15 truck parking spaces at this location, uh, so drivers can save time from uh, can save time from circling around or driving to a truck facility to find that all the spaces are full. Um, so way stations um, are, are accessed by many truck drivers um, and currently there are some way stations where drivers may um, stay for longer than permitted um, or also when way stations are closed. Uh, but seeing that these um, that these way stations are frequented by drivers so often, um, there's opportunities to formalize uh, some truck parking storage or uh, truck parking facilities um, at these specific way stations. Uh, what some other municipalities have done is to allow uh, truck parking in uh, rural residential areas. Um, this has been implemented in BC, um, keeping in mind that these are very large areas, there's very low density um, so that you're not uh, interrupting any traffic flow or parking right in someone's backyard. 
Uh, these are areas where there's a lot more space available for trucks to park. Uh, the next thing we're looking into was uh, public-private partnerships. Uh, so this is where the municipality would incentivize different developers to provide truck parking facilities uh, through various incentives or uh, tax abatements or low-cost loans. Um, just recognizing that the, the private industry has a lot of space that they may not be using and they can really leverage it for um, truck parking. And the last topic that we looked into was uh, the off-peak deliveries. Um, the main premise behind this is to shift the truck activity outside of your peak traffic periods. And this could really reduce uh, the congestion that uh, truck drivers have to drive through and the associated emissions uh, from all of the stop and start um, activity. And that was uh, what we looked into for truck parking. So any of the recommendations uh, that we make out of this study will make sure um, that they align with uh, the industry best practices that we have, uh, that we've researched. And the last best practice area that we looked into uh, is shown on the next slide. Um, and these are the different emerging trends. Uh, the transportation industry is very rapidly um, there's a lot of different um, emerging trends and evolutions in how we use uh, transportation and how we use the roads. And we definitely want to make sure that our uh, parking strategies are future proof and that they are looking to accommodate um, this rapidly changing environment. Uh, so the first thing that we looked into is the shared economy. Uh, these can consist of rideshare services such as Uber and Lyft. Um, the, and also vehicle share. So um, large operators like Enterprise, Zipcar, Caminato, um, these are fleet-based car share companies that can really help reduce vehicle ownership. Um, there's also micromobility providers. So uh, these are um, bike share, uh, electric bike share or electric scooters, and also uh, mobility as a service. Uh, so this involves uh, integrated trip planning, booking, payment uh, for multimodal trips all in one platform. And what shared economy um, uses can do for us is really reduce the amount of uh, vehicle ownership. If you have access to all of these different, um, these different technologies and uh, platforms, uh, you might not need to own a car. And then that would also reduce the associated parking uh, demand and supply that's required. Um, another emerging trend is looking at the connected and automated vehicles. Um, with with this type of uh, with these types of vehicles, um, it's still fairly unknown how it will really impact vehicle ownership. But a lot of people are thinking that um, this will reduce the amount of uh, vehicle ownership if you can just call a car that will pick you up. Uh, you don't need to drive your car and park it at where you work. Uh, you can just call a connected auto autonomous vehicle and pick you up and drop you off at work. Uh, so this might reduce the parking demand and also um, the and also increase the uh, the amount of parking that is sitting empty. Um, but one thing that it might increase uh, is the curb space demand uh, related to that pickup and drop off. Uh, with these vehicles. Uh, another thing that we looked into is the partnerships. Uh, so this is uh, really making, uh, taking advantage of either existing uh, parking infrastructure or uh, building new parking infrastructure into new developments. Uh, so with shared parking, um, the premise behind this is that you can identify um, if there's two different land uses that are close to each other, um, there could be an opportunity to share uh, to make use of a shared parking resource uh, based on the land use. So for example, if there is an office and a, a restaurant next to each other, um, offices are typically um, parking or the parking demand for offices are typically full during working hours. So say nine to five, uh, while for restaurants, your parking demand might pick up at 5 p.m. and extend into the evening. And you can see that during those times, uh, there isn't much of an overlap in terms of your parking demand periods. Uh, so there's opportunities there for them to share these parking facilities so you can, um, so you don't need to build uh, multiple parking spaces for all of your different land uses. 
And another thing that some municipalities are doing is uh, entering into par par uh, partnerships with private developers. Uh, so if a private developer is building a parking lot or is building a residential development uh, downtown, uh, there's opportunity. There might be an opportunity for the city to make a partnership with the private developer and have them maybe add a different, uh, add a, add an additional um, underground parking level since the land use is going to be there anyways. Um, it's not you're not going to be having just an empty surface lot uh, in your downtown. And the last topic was looking into the logistics management. Uh, so including things like integrated freight systems or uh, and also encouraging smaller trucks in urban areas. Um, a, a very popular thing that's happening right now are, um, are these multimodal trucking centers or um, freight consolidation centers. Uh, so this, the main purpose of this is to avoid having your really large, um, your large heavy vehicles um, driving through urban areas. Uh, so there would be a consolidation center where all of the trucks come off of the highway and unload all of their um, all of their cargo uh, at these consolidation centers. And what would happen is that smaller trucks would pick up from those areas and distribute it uh, within the urban areas. So you might have smaller trucks driving along your streets. So it makes things safer from a road user safety standpoint and also um, reduce con congestion from um, from the fact that you just have smaller vehicles on your roads. And that brings us to our next uh, interactive poll. Uh, so based on all of the different uh, best practices topics that I looked into, um, which of the areas do you believe are in most need of improvements or which, which topics do you find most interesting that you think we should be including or looking a little bit more into as part of our study. And you can also select up to uh, your top two um, categories for this. Um, yeah, just a quick recap. Uh, we looked into parking pricing strategies. So how do we determine how to set our parking prices? Um, looking at uh, location-based or performance-based metrics. Um, we also have our parking rates. So how do we set our parking prices? What do we set them at? Um, just understanding that um, the goal is to have a financially sustainable parking system where uh, we can, where all of the costs are paid for by revenues. Uh, parking permits, this can consist of residential, um, visitor or monthly parking permits, uh, things like parking technology where you can pay for parking through your phone. Uh, you can um, look into smart parking meters, uh, parking occupancy technology. Uh, next thing was that uh, the parking enforcement. So uh, different technologies that make parking enforcement more efficient and uh, more effective. And then also looking at the parking minimums and maximums, a trend is that uh, the parking minimums are being reduced or even eliminated and to try to combat the oversupply of parking. And then lastly, last topic was the uh, looking into strategies to manage uh, or increase the availability of truck parking uh, for the various uh, uh, players in the truck uh, industry. So, Stefan, if I can jump in, we're just going to be closing the poll shortly. Yep. But I just wanted to remind everybody, feel free to use the written chat, as a number of you already have, to share your valued perspective, your ideas, your comments. A number of, of good pieces of information have already come in. I encourage you to keep sending them. And also, we're starting to near the end of the presentation. So please feel free to share any questions you might have as well about what you've been hearing. And We'll look to try to tackle some of those. But Stefan, back to you to share the results from the poll. Sure, thanks, Glenn. Uh, yeah, so looking at the poll, um, the most, I guess the most popular best practice area was looking at uh, parking minimums and maximums, uh, where 51%, so just over half of the uh, participants, uh, felt that this was one of their uh, topics they're most interested in. Uh, the next one is looking at parking technologies. So um, different technologies like phone applications or smart parking meters um, that can uh, 
that can make the the user experience for paying for parking and also knowing where parking facilities are available a lot more convenient and the third one is truck parking where 35 percent of you uh noted that that was an interest area so that's really interesting i think definitely it generally aligns with the the interest uh with other uh, consultations we've done and also um, with new advancements in the in the parking industry. So thank you everyone for for sharing your inputs there. And the next section that I'll be taking us through is the parking demand analysis. Uh, so this task involved um, Thanks for switching. And so this part, this task involved examining the downtown parking system. Uh, so traditionally, the, the Brampton city of Brampton staff have con collected quarterly data uh, ranging going back all the way from 2009 and up to uh, 2019. Uh, so they surveyed all of the uh, publicly accessible parking facilities uh, within the downtown area. Uh, so the map on the left shows the different uh, shows the uh, the surveyed downtown parking supply. Uh, the green lines uh, show the uh, municipal on street parking. And for this, there was uh, a little more than 250 uh, on street parking spaces. Uh, the blue polygons show the municipal off street parking lots. So these are the lots owned by the city of Brampton. And there's a little more than 1,800. Uh, parking spaces. And then uh, the brown, uh, all the brown polygons show the uh, privately owned but still publicly accessible uh, off street parking facilities. And there's uh, more than 2,300 uh, private uh, on street spaces. Uh, so that's a total of a little more than 4,400 parking spaces that are available uh, to the public located in downtown. Um, and it should also be noted that this is only looking at the downtown parking supply uh, and parking operations. Uh, we will have a residential parking uh, task um, that we're asking for um, that we're, where we'll identify challenges based on the uh, engagement activities and surveys that my colleague Attila mentioned, and also uh, just an understanding of uh, local issues based on background document review and discussions we've had with city staff. And the next slide shows the actual parking uh, utilization. Uh, so this is how many, the proportion of parking spaces that are, uh, that are occupied. Um, so right now what we're looking at is um, parking demand from March, 2019 um, at 10 a.m. And this was the highest um, parking demand that we observed um, within uh, that year. Uh, so for uh, all of our parking utilization studies, we typically target a 85% uh, utilization uh, during the peak hour. Uh, so this represents conditions where um, the parking spaces are generally well utilized, uh, but it's not completely full. Uh, so if you need to be able to quickly find a parking space close to your destination, um, you're able to do that uh, relatively quickly. Um, and what we're seeing right now uh, on the right side is the, the legend. Uh, so the dark green uh, is looking at parking where uh, you are between 0%, so you're empty, and 50% uh, full. Uh, the slightly lighter green shows uh, between 50 and 70% full. Uh, the orange shows 70 to 85% full, so that's kind of our target range. And then uh, the red shows uh, parking facilities that are uh, between 85% and 100% full. Uh, so in general, what we're seeing here is um, the go parking uh, lot. So this is near uh, Main Street and Nielsen. Uh, the go parking lot is completely full. Um, that makes sense given our, um, given our experience with uh, the go parking lots. It can be very busy and this was at 10 a.m. So a, all, a lot of the commuters would have already been uh, at work at this point. Um, but the rest of the downtown system is uh, relatively, uh, there's a lot of excess capacity here. Uh, you can see that there's a lot of dark green um, uh, throughout the downtown. Um, there is one street, uh, George Street, where um, there are, it was observed to be essentially full, but if you look at the adjacent streets 
and also the uh, nearby parking, uh, off-street parking lots, um, there's plenty of demand, uh, plenty of supply to accommodate that demand. And overall, um, we saw a 41% utilization rate of on-street parking, 60% uh, of the municipal parking facilities were full, and then 59% uh, of the privately owned uh, but publicly accessible off-street parking facilities were full. And the next slide here uh, just shows some of the shows the annual parking um, utilization for the entire downtown system uh, over the years. Uh, so you can see that um, again these counts were conducted on a quarterly basis ever since 2009. Um, so definitely uh, looking back in 2009, we're seeing parking utilizations of over 60 percent. And over the years, you can see that there have been some uh, steady declines and uh, around 2016, it's a little bit more stable and uh, carrying us forward to 2019. Uh, we, we tried to link a few changes in uh, the parking demand uh, and tried to compare them to changes in the transportation network. Um, there's likely other contributing factors, but some of the key um, key contributions might be um, in September 2010. So that's where you see a significant decrease in that parking demand. Uh, that's when uh, the Zoom uh, bus rapid transit, uh, they launched their first transit route, uh, Route 501, uh, which was Queen. So that connects Brampton to Vaughan and it runs along uh, Queen Street and Highway 7. So that might have reduced a lot of parking demand, um, maybe some downtown employees choosing to take transit. Uh, to work instead of driving and then also in september 2015 where there's a smaller reduction in parking demand uh, that was when go transit added uh, 14 new midday train trips um, connecting brampton to the unions to union station and also made other updates to uh, uh, updated schedules uh, to improve go bus service so again, those might be some of the major contributions, but there are likely other factors to why we're seeing a steady decline in parking demand over the years. And this next slide just shows the hourly parking demand throughout the day. Uh, you can see that there's two lines here, uh, the blue line being 2009 and the orange line being 2019. Uh, so this really drives home the point that um, compared to 2009 data, um, our parking demand in 2019 uh, significantly reduced. Um, in 2009, we saw a, park, a peak parking occupancy of a little more than 80%, which has reduced to 60% in 2019. And the last slide that I'll be taking us through is looking at uh, the Brampton Transit ridership, uh, the growth in ridership compared to the growth in vehicle ownership. Uh, so between 2011 and 2016, uh, this graph shows uh, the increases in transit ridership uh, based on your peak period. Uh, we collected that, or we provided ridership data uh, during the evening, uh, during midday, and during the peak uh, periods, which were the AM and the PM uh, commuter periods. And over the same time period, uh, we were uh, we analyzed the the vehicle ownership growth in Brampton. And what this, uh, the key takeaway of this is showing that um, both vehicle and transit ridership uh, was increasing over the years, which is consistent with uh, the fact that Brampton is a growing city. Uh, but it really drives home the point that transit ridership is growing at a significantly larger rate compared to auto ownership. Um, based on your peak period, transit ridership was increasing like 30 to 50% almost, uh, while during the same time, trend, uh, vehicle ownership was around I think, 12 or 13%. Um, so it's definitely important to continue to support uh, these sustainable transportation modes, um, but also acknowledging that car use is still common and there are um, vehicle parking issues that need to be addressed. And now I will pass it back over to Pete uh, to take us through the next steps.
Great. Thank you, Stefan and Attila. Just a few more slides before we dive into the open discussion. So thank you for all the great questions in the chat so far and for participating over the last uh, 70 or so minutes. So the next few slides will go over the next steps for this project. So on the screen now, you can see the project is split into two stages. We're nearing the end of stage one. So in, in the first quarter, first three months of this year, we will complete a public survey trucking survey, future parking demand, and policy frame, uh, parking policy framework. The parking and truck surveys are live until the end of January. There's links on the public website, which I'll go over on the next slide, and perhaps someone from Brampton post in the chat. And then on stage two, we will, it's broken into two quarters, we will complete the financial plan review and the parking management plan in the second quarter of this year. And then towards the back half of the year, we will have additional public consultation and we will submit the Brampton parking plan report. On the next slide, I will cover off um, ways to get in touch with us. So we want to hear from you. And as Glenn and others have noted, it's very important. The public engagement sessions, the feedback, the great questions I've been seeing go through the chat. We do have a study webpage, has lots of information, has the survey links. It's uh, Brampton.ca slash parking plan, which will be posted in the chat again. You can complete the surveys. Uh, public engagement sessions, we've been using this to provide feedback and as an opportunity to ask questions. So there's obviously this meeting, and then there's three more meetings with dates to be um, established. Online survey, as I noted, is live for the public uh, yourselves. So you can complete the online questionnaire to let us know about your uh, parking issues, your use of parking, priorities for improvement, and things such as that. And comments uh, can be emailed to us or submitted at any time. And the emails are on the next slide. The main points of contact being uh, the project manager uh, on the Brampton side, uh, Malik, and his email address is on the screen. There's the project email, Bram uh, parking strategy at brampton.ca, and then Attila as uh, IBI study lead can be reached at that email address shown there. And then uh, turn it over to Glenn to facilitate our open discussion. Glenn? Hey, thanks, uh, Pete, and uh, all of the team from IBI for the very informative presentation. If you've joined us in progress, you've been listening to the team from IBI who are assisting the city of Brampton with the parking plan initiative. I'm Glenn Pache. I'm serving as the independent facilitator for today's session. And again, thank you to everyone for participating, both for your interest in the topic and for the questions and comments that have already been provided. Now, I'll just note some people have have said through the chat that some of the polling numbers they were seeing weren't quite jiving with some of the things that Pete or others were sharing earlier. And it appears to be a case of whether you are seeing the non-respondents or not. So don't get hung up on that. We'll have the accurate data collected as part of tonight's initiative. So we've heard from the city. We have heard from the planning consultant team. Now it's time to hear from all of you, our session participants. And um, give me a couple of minutes to just explain how you can do this. Some of you are veterans, you use WebEx all the time. For others, tonight might be the first time that you are doing so. So I'll note first that there are a number of questions to which the team would like to get your responses. And you see them on screen right now. They're numbered one through four. Um, if you would like to respond to those in writing through the chat, please be sure to reference the question number so the team is, is clear about what you're responding to. For example, you might say Q2 and then put your answer to question two. Um, your answers will help inform and shape the Brampton parking plan. So in this portion of the meeting, we want to give you the opportunity to respond to those questions, but more than that, to ask any questions you might have and to share any comments about what you've heard or perhaps your ideas about where the Brampton parking plan might go in terms of recommendations. So really quickly, let me explain how you can do that in particular for those of you, again, who are less familiar with the WebEx platform. 
You can share your comments in writing or you can share them orally. If you choose to share your thoughts in writing, use the chat function. And again, if you're not familiar with how to do that, you can open the chat window by clicking on the chat icon that is typically found at the far right bottom of your screen. Select send to everyone in the little send to box and then type your question, your comment, your observation, your responses to the questions that the team have, have posed in the chat box it sent itself, and then click send or hit return to move that along to everyone. Your question or your comment may be shared live, that is out loud by me or a member of the team, so be aware of that. Should your questions, comments, um, answers not be addressed this evening. Again, please be assured that they will be considered in the project team documentation as part of the parking plan project. So I wanna give you that assurance. If you wanna share your thoughts orally, and I mentioned this at the beginning, you have the opportunity to, to speak to the questions that have been asked or to share your questions or to share your comments. And you can do that um, by raising your hand electronically. So if you've joined by a computer or a tablet or a smartphone with screen capability, you can click the raise hand button, again, that is typically found at the bottom of your screen within the reactions item. So simply click on the reactions item, which is basically the smiley face or the emoticon icon that you see at the bottom of your screen, that will open it up. Then you'll see the opportunity to click on the raised hand icon within that to get into the queue. And I see some of you have done that already, so that's great. At the appropriate time, so hold on for now, we'll invite you to unmute and to speak. Now, I mentioned um, earlier that, well, actually, let me cover one more thing. Depending on the device and your means of accessing WebEx, in order to see the raise hand function, you may, you may have to click on the participants button and then the participants window would open to the right of your screen. And then you should see a raised hand icon beside your name if you hover your cursor over it. So that's another opportunity to raise your hand. But I mentioned if you're participating with a simple phone that is a non-web enabled device, if you wanna get into the conversation and raise your hand electronically, you need to press star Three. Again, that is star three if you're on a simple non-web enabled phone. And you can mute and unmute your phone by pressing star six. So again, star three to raise your hand electronically, star six if you're on a simple phone to mute and to unmute. So if you're selected to speak, again, make sure that you enable your microphone, but we'll come to you in, in just a little bit. Um, again, depending on how many people want to speak, we'll see if we can get you all in. We're looking to go up until about 8 o'clock this evening to be respectful of everyone's time. And once you've spoken, um, please remute yourself and please lower your hand. And if you lose the connection or we are unable to hear you, we will unfortunately need to move to the next participant. And we invite you, of course, to reconnect um, using the WebEx link and we'll do our best to try to get you back in. Um, so. Again, there are four questions. Feel free to answer them through the chat or to answer them verbally. We're happy to take your questions and your comments as well. And in fact, I'm gonna go back to some of the questions that were asked throughout the presentation. And I'll just start with a few of those to kick us off. And Attila, maybe I'll ask you to answer this first one. It was asked early on, somebody had said, does the rule of thumb for parking spaces, one vehicle to four spaces, take into account just the cars or other modes of transportation like delivery trucks? So Attila, can you answer that one for us? Yep, yes, of course. Uh, the rule of thumb refers to personal vehicles only. So the, the local residents, people living in Brenton, we wouldn't be including the, the delivery trucks that are, are driving through Brenton. 
Okay. And then there was another question of fact or clarification. Somebody is asking um, that when you guys were talking earlier about the cities in North America that you looked at to draw the best um, uh, in parking practices, what were those cities? What cities did you look at? And I don't know if Stefan or Attila, who's best to respond to that one? I know Stefan took us through some of the information yeah. there. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So uh, yeah, in terms of the Canadian cities, we looked at Calgary, Edmonton, Ottawa, Windsor, and Winnipeg. Um, and then in terms of the American cities, we looked at Austin, Buffalo, Cleveland, Columbus, Hartford, New Orleans, San Antonio, San Francisco, and Seattle. And they were all informed based on cities that had uh, progressive parking policies um, that Brampton wanted to model themselves after. Okay. And then there have been a number of comments about go parking and it's spilling out onto streets and so forth. Can anyone answer for us what is within the city of Brampton's sphere of control or purview of control in terms of parking? So for example, go parking or parking in private lots and so forth. What, what can the city influence? What can it control and so forth? And um, I'll again, invite Attila or Stefan to kick us off and maybe somebody from the city wants to jump in as well. I, I can start off and then if uh, Stefan has any additional thoughts, feel free to jump in. Uh, that's, a, that's a great question and it actually does line up very well with the findings of the parking supply and demand counts that were completed for this study. If you recall when Stefan was presenting, the, the go lot was, was dark red, indicating that it, it was operating at capacity. So we'll be looking at um, a few different approaches to, to tackle this. We don't have the results yet, as I noted, this, this is still the first, it's, it's close to the, the study beginning, but some options could include uh, the, the shared parking. So looking for additional parking opportunities in the area that are underutilized during the business hours where commuters could find uh, some off-street parking as well. Uh, also the, the different transportation demand management strategies that we're going to be looking at to help manage the, you know, try and promote alternative modes of transportation, which I recognize that uh, Go Transit is, but there could be alternative modes that uh, that people uh, people could be using. So we'll be trying to promote people to uh, carpool. Uh, and then, so there's different uh, ways to, uh, to reduce the parking demand. So that's another approach. So let me pose one more question that's come in through the chat and we'll try to get to some others later, but I wanna go as well to hearing from some people live and, and verbally. So Elaine, we'll be coming to you in just a moment and Sylvia, you're on deck so that you can just be ready. So again, we'll be coming to the two of you in just a couple of minutes. But the other question before we get there was in regards to the upcoming builds in low and high rise development, are they forced to provide on-site parking spaces so that the excess parking doesn't spill onto city streets? Attila, do you want to kick us off on that one? Yeah, and uh, that's that's a great question. So those would be governed by the the zoning bylaw requirements that were discussed as as part of the study. Uh, the city is actually in the process of updating the the zoning bylaw requirements to to be suitable to what the, the different developments are expected to, to generate. Um, I do want to note that a best practice has been to reduce to the minimums and sometimes even implement uh, parking maximums in, in some of the more intensification areas. Uh, I, I can't speak specifically to the, the developments that are, that are uh, the, the question is, is posed about, but as, as a best practice, uh, yes, there is uh, on-site parking being provided uh, that's in line, in line with uh, the zoning bylaws. Okay, and again, I'll come back to some of the other questions in the chat in a little bit, but I'd like to invite those who have raised their hands electronically to jump in. Elaine, as I mentioned, you're first up. I see that you have unmuted. Please go ahead as soon as you're ready. I have. Thank you, panel, for your presentation. A couple of concerns uh, that I'd like to raise or that I have concerns with is with regards to the best in practices, the cities that you have used in terms of moving forward. The population in the, the majority of those areas are far greater than Brampton. So that's one area of concern that I have um, that I want to raise for your consideration in moving forward. 
Uh, with regards to your open discussion questions, number one, do I find it difficult uh, parking in a place of residence in my neighborhood? At times, yes, I do, even though um, I'm in the northwest end of Brampton. Where I have difficulty is with the number of uh, unregistered basement apartments. So we have a lot of um, illegal basement apartments and the overflow of parking on the street. Where that challenge becomes heightened is overnight parking and especially during the winter months. I would be more in favor of parking permits for the individual residential vehicles and or trucks and transport trucks that park um, in my community. Thank you. Thank you, Elaine. We appreciate your comments and your responses to at least some of the questions. Um, so Sylvia, I promised you would be next. And just to let you know, Andrew, you were on deck. But Sylvia, if you would be so kind as to unmute and please go ahead as soon as you're ready, please share your questions and or comments or responses to the questions that the team has raised. Go ahead, Sylvia. Uh, so a couple things. One, um, do I find parking difficult at my place of residence? This is a yes and no question. I live in an older townhouse condominium complex and it was built with two parking spots for every single unit and exactly zero units of visitor parking uh, and that's kind of an issue. Uh, we actually have very good transit so the parking lot so some of the houses have garages some have driveways and some have are in the parking lot because it's a private court. Uh, a bunch of the parking is underutilized because there's actually because car ownership is incredibly expensive especially for instance car insurance rates. We actually have good transit over the rules on requirements for number of parking spaces means that the townhouse complex cannot do something like purchase uh, underutilized parking spaces and create visitor parking. So this is a case where parking requirements are actually making it harder to find parking. And that's actually quite frustrating. Um, Sorry, go ahead. Anything else? Uh, to address the previous caller's thing about parking on the streets, the issue so in Brampton, the parking and housing crises have actually fed into each other where high parking requirements have resulted in a shortage of uh, residential units, which results in um, the, single, the small unit demand being met inside of single family homes. And so there's lots of basement apartments and stuff. And so the number of adults per household is significantly exceeding what the houses were planned for in terms of parking. And so in older parts of Brampton, this isn't as big an issue due to adult kids often having moved out, uh, but it's starting to be an issue with international students. But the older parts of Brampton have very good transit. And so um, a lot of the demand can be actually offloaded to transit. In the newer parts like Northwest Brampton, Northeast Brampton, there have been, the city has not increased transit service fast enough. And the result of that is that you have overcrowded transit so people who can uh who don't actually need to drive uh quote unquote choice riders will say screw this and then go buy a car and drive and there's no space to park the cars and it just kind of accumulates if we want to deal with the driveway widening issue we want to deal with the cars cl constantly cluttering up streets the city has to actually improve transit the ridership has gone up significantly but the issue is this term of council has basically has added very little in the way of service hours. Um, previous terms of council added to 60 to 65,000 a year. And this term of council is looking at over four years. So when comparable terms added approximately 250,000 per term, this council is going to end with 100,000, less than 100,000 added, even though the population has significantly grown faster. So in 2019, where so seeing... we added service hours, the system was overcrowded. And in 2020, January of 2020, as soon as we added service hours, it was overcrowded again. People don't want to be spending thirty to forty thousand dollars their household income on cars. It's a case of the lack of alternatives being provided by the city because there's just literally not enough transit capacity in parts of the city. And in newer parts, the transit capacity hasn't arrived yet. 
it, it's forcing people to buy cars. And if gotcha. you actually fix that, people drop cars very aggressively. I know plenty of households where there's like four adults per household and there's three cars and there's like transit passes that are shared. So it's like you kind of have collective household keys. It's like there's the same thing for transit passes. And if we improve transit, then they could get rid of a third car. And if we had things like car sharing where it, like all the community centers and um, bus terminals and stuff, people could get a car if they needed it for a short period of time. Um, that would make it a lot easier for people to drop an additional car. Yeah, no, I hear you loud and clear. So yeah, the importance of transit and alternatives to the vehicles can really have a dramatic impact on parking requirements and so forth. Appreciate the comments. Thank you. Um, I want to go to Andrew next, but before I do that, I'm going to pose a couple of questions that have come in through the chat. And by the way, when I'm referring to people, I'm referring to the screen name. So I just said Sylvia because that was the screen name that I was seeing. So that's how I'll continue to do it. Feel free to provide, you know, to introduce yourselves if your name happens to be different from the one on the screen. But Andrew, you'll be up in a moment. Sylvia, um, thank you for the comment. And a couple of questions, though, from the chat. Someone is asking, has there been any consideration to remove or reduce the parking ratio for proposed affordable housing or shelter uses? Um, Attila, has there been any thought given to that yet? I know you're early in the process. Yes, and that's a great question that ties into the, the previous question that, that was asked about the res uh, the, the high-rise uh, residential buildings. Uh, so we, we will be looking at uh, reducing the parking minimums. Uh, the affordable housing has been one of the items that was specifically identified in, in the request for proposal. So it's uh, definitely going to be included in the study. Uh, I don't have any uh, findings for you just yet since uh, that's part of uh, one of the tasks that's, ha that's yet to have been started. Uh, we will be touching upon it in one of the future uh, engagement sessions. So. Uh, so feel free to join then, and we'll hopefully have some uh, findings for you to discuss then. So let me ask one more question again that's come through the chat, and we'll be going to Andrew in a moment. And again, a reminder to others, if you would like to speak tonight, and you're very much welcome to do so, we'd love to hear your questions and comments um, orally, verbally. Um, please feel free to raise your hand electronically, and we'll look to get you into the queue. But the other question through the chat, Attila, was, has there been any consideration to incorporate EV parking rates in proposed parking rates for new developments. So I'm assuming the EV is electric vehicles, but go ahead, Attila. Yeah, another, another great question. Uh, electric vehicles is, is one of the emerging trends that we'll, we'll be looking at for sure. A lot of municipalities have already included these requirements. So and typically it's a function of the, the total number of parking spaces that are required. A certain proportion of them are required to be electric vehicle. Uh, and, and that is something that we'll be considering for Brampton as well. Okay, thank you. So we'll go to Andrew now. Um, Andrew, whenever you're ready, please feel free to unmute and share your question and or comment. And again, everyone, the team would love to get your responses to the four questions that are on screen. Some of you have provided them already, but I welcome you, I, I urge you, um, I invite you to, to send in more responses to any or all of those questions. The team would really appreciate it. But Andrew, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I am actually um, responding to question three. I am familiar with um, park, uh, truck parking issues in different cities and jurisdictions, including the US, but I want to um, dive deeper here. I would like to, I know you are doing the public consultations, but I want to know up to this moment, based on your research and the work behind leading to the strategy, what are the complaints, concerns raised about truck parking? particularly experienced in, in, in Brampton? Like, is it mainly about street parking, residential or non-residential? Or is it about availability of commercial parking spaces? Any associated concern about truck, like dimensions, not big enough, or noise, or time and hours? 
who are the people raising concern, the industry users, residents, and any recommendations you have so far? Like recently in in one of the U.S. city, the whole city banned truck parking. Okay, so that's okay. what I, I'm interested in. Great, thank you, Andrew. So again, not to do justice to your eloquence, what I'm hearing Andrew ask is, what are the, what is the nature of the complaints, the issues, the concerns yes, relating to truck parking, and from where are they coming? Attila, can you kick us off on that, and maybe someone else wants to join in as well? Yeah, actually, I'll uh, flip this this question over to to Stefan. Yeah, so thanks for your question, Andrew. Uh, so what we've heard so far uh, is that the major truck parking challenges are related to trucks parking uh, on streets. Uh, they might be local streets, they might be uh, larger scale streets. So these might uh, this might cause uh, congestion issues if they're stopped in uh, live lanes or they might be partially obstructing some of these live lanes. Um, another challenge that we've heard is that uh, trucks are parking in uh, non-permitted areas. Um, this might be arising from the fact that there's a lack of designated truck parking facilities. So uh, truck drivers are just stopping where they see available space. Um, so this is what we've heard from, uh, from internal project meetings from uh, city staff. Uh, but another part of our study is that we have a, uh, a survey out to, um, to stakeholders and uh, other truck companies uh, within the industry and we're hoping that through that survey, we can really pinpoint uh, here directly from the truck drivers themselves and uh, other logistics companies, uh, what the challenges are so that we can make sure what they're addressed in the study. And thank you again to Andrew for the question, much appreciated. I'm gonna be going to V Sharma in a moment and then to Mukesh um, following that. But just before I do so, another question that's come in and until I'll start with you, but again, you might want to invite some of your colleagues to jump in. And we hear this a lot relating to not just parking, but to transportation and transit. What does a post-COVID world mean for parking in Brampton? You know, what do we anticipate are the implications of more people, you know, continuing to work, to work from home or engaging in a hybrid working model and so forth. Is your team looking at that as part of its analysis? Yes, that's, that's a very good question and a very hot topic in today's world for sure. Uh, the, there's, there's no one knows exactly how parking demand is going to be rebounding uh, post COVID. Uh, Pre-COVID, uh, we had parking demand at a certain level, and then once the, the pandemic hit, parking demand decreased. Uh, we're going to anticipate some rebounds in parking demand, but it's not entirely clear uh, to what extent uh, parking demand will rebound to the, the pre-COVID levels. Uh, that's why we're, we're approaching this, this, uh, this uh, challenge with a, um, with a flexible approach. So we're, we're completing a, a sensitivity analysis where we're, we're investigating different levels of, of parking demand to really get an, uh, a feel for how the, the Brampton parking system would, would operate uh, under different levels of, uh, of, of the parking demand rebound. Thank you. So I'm going to go now, as promised, uh, again, I'm seeing V Sharma on my screen. Um, please unmute and go ahead whenever you're ready. And Mukesh, you're on deck, will be coming to you soon. And again, I would invite anyone else, if you have questions or comments, to send them along through the chat. We're focusing more on the questions um, during this part of the, the meeting because, of course, your written responses will be captured and can be reviewed at any time. Um, but V. Sharma, please go ahead. Thank you, Glenn. You're Hi. welcome. Uh, good evening, guys. Uh, thank you so much for listening to our concerns and views. Thank you so much for giving us a chance to express our views. I just have a quick question. I'm not sure if you guys have an answer. This is a question for uh, for Attila. Uh, have you guys done any uh, any parking research, or is there any parking research regarding the uh, the high rise buildings which are going to be at Chopper's World location? Uh, there are, there are going to be at least more than eight to ten high-rise building and some uh, I, I mean there's a plan but has there been any research done regarding the parking uh, because like that point is already kind of choked because of the number of cars and traffic but uh, so what will be the future plan do you guys have any information regarding that thank you 
Thank you. So Attila, again, is uh, is there has any research been done? Do you have any information available about the topic that was just raised? So I, I can't comment on specifically the the example that was was noted. I can answer on a more more higher level. Uh, we're we're definitely going to be looking at the parking requirements for intensification areas. The, the downtown area. So this could very well capture the, the instance that was noted. Uh, typically there would be parking justification studies or uh, that would be completed for uh, new developments as part of the application process that would look into these issues. And uh, I, I can't say that I've, I've, I've seen that for, for this one. Uh, would um, would someone from the, the city like to, to jump in and uh, provide some more insights into, into this question? Yeah, let's uh, invite our friends from the city. Can anybody provide any additional detail? Yeah, Glenn, it's uh, Commissioner Richard uh, forward here. We've got Great, a, a couple of folks on the line that can probably speak to that. Uh, what we know about Shoppers World is that it's going to be uh, it's a transformational project. So we're looking at, I think, a close to 5,000 units. But Henry Soberg, who's our senior manager of transportation, is on the call and can certainly speak to and we also have to recognize that LRT is coming up to that point of uh, here Ontario and Steel Street, so it's fitting in nicely with the uh, with the provincial direction in terms of uh, major transportation, uh, you know, transit areas, and how do you uh, how how you develop the future uh, community around that. So maybe Henrik, if you don't mind, just uh, providing a few comments. Sure, uh, just very briefly and thanks Richard and uh, and, and for the question. Um, yeah, I think what we're looking at with something like Shoppers World too, it, it is a transformational project. I think in, in what's outlined in the city vision um, for these areas is we're taking advantage of, uh, of corridors that are um, that are not, they're being planned for, for those higher densities, but that they already, they are going to have or are planned to have um, a very robust uh, transit service as well. And I think where we're where we're moving towards, I mean, as a as a growing city, as a big city, when we look to examples like, um, you know, the Toronto's of the world, uh, the you know Edmonton, Calgary, a lot of these places that have been um, the the examples uh, for for benchmarking this current study, um, is, you know, we're trying to get away from this this notion, uh, this this kind of present day. Uh, projection of, of the demand that, uh, you know, with every single unit, we're generating a car trip and we're trying to discourage that. And that that's reflected in the, you know, the, the, the effort that's going in to provide uh, that level of service. So, you know, the, the future LRT on here, Ontario, um, the city uh, with Metrolinx, we are working as well on, on rapid transit on steels and the city's in fact advocating very strongly uh, for for rapid transit on uh, on on Steeles Avenue as well, um, I think the other point behind something like the Shoppers World development is we're doing something uh, kind of a concept called our, our you know our, our fifteen or twenty minute communities, where we're trying to provide that mix of uh, you know of, of, of lifestyle uses, uh, you know commercial work, uh, institutional, uh, residential uh, within you know within that twenty minute walk uh, parameter so that that diminishes or, or eliminates the need for for certainly for as much parking as we would typically see in uh, in, in, in a conventional suburban example. Um, so this is it's it's an evolution and it's kind of a growth process. And I think that a lot of uh, the work in this study um, will be addressing that at kind of a policy level. Uh, but work on Shoppers World, I think, is certainly uh, considering that uh, um, as well. I mean, everything from what we've been talking about uh, issuing of parking maximums, um, and then, like I said earlier, uh, the, the the focus on making sure that we have a very good connected transit system. We have a terminal there already. Um, the LRT, our active transportation network to encourage uh, trips by by means um, other than the automobile where they're practicable. And I think I wanted to get the other point that I wanted to make. I think just in general here, um, when we're talking about even at the GO station and the parking demand at the GO station. The 20 minute community uh, concept, you know, it is intended to eliminate some of that parking need. Um, but even when we look at, uh, for example, the the, the uh, trips that are being made to the GO station, um, they're predominantly very short. They're relatively short uh, and we're seeing, you know, five to seven kilometers as a maximum for those length for those trip distances, which are very much doable in, uh, you know, by other 
uh, more sustainable modes if we provide that kind of infrastructure. So that's why we're looking uh, in this study too, I think has addressed things like uh, they mentioned micro mobility. So e-scooters, bike shares, um, uh, we'll be looking at you know car sharing strategies, a whole host of these other um, alternatives uh, that, uh, that can hopefully make this a, a much more sustainable city. Great, thanks, Henrik, and thank you as well to Commissioner thank you. Ford for jumping in, and and thank you, V Sharma, for the question that got us going on. On thank you so much, guys. Thank you so much. Okay, take care. Um, so I'm going to go to Mukesh in a moment, but just a heads up, everybody, we're getting into the last ten, five to ten minutes where we're going to be taking questions or comments uh, live, and then we'll use the last few minutes to recap next steps. And I know Malik uh, wants to say a few words on behalf of the city, and then I'll formally draw things to a close. So again, if you want to get in, please feel free to raise your hand electronically. We'll get you into the queue. I know we've got another a couple of questions have come in as well through the chat. I'll get to those in a moment. Um, but Mukesh, you were up next. Um, please unmute and go ahead whenever you're ready. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, it's been an amazing uh, uh, webinar so far. A lot of information flowing. Uh, thanks for uh, giving us an opportunity to speak as well. Oh, you're very uh, welcome. Yeah, so my question was, uh, have we cons uh, I come from a technology and a farming background, so I wanted to ask if, uh, you know, are there any possibilities of utilizing roof spaces of the parking infrastructure, maybe for uh, some uh, roof garden or some greenhouse, or uh, even it could be for, uh, you know, some multi-purpose arrangements like, you know, green energy, making electrical charging stations, or, you know, even having some green towers to build a, a kind of some sustainable urban farming structures. And Mukesh, I lost you for a moment. Did you say, was there consideration of using, did you say rural areas? Not rural areas. I was uh, saying uh, regarding, you know, uh, repurposing uh, these uh, spaces, like, you know, the roof. Oh, re repurposing. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Yeah. I just lost the connection for a moment. Thank you. So, Attil, I'll ask you to jump in. Um, has any consideration been given to doing the kinds of things that Mukesh just mentioned? Yes. Uh, any way we can improve the sustainability of, of parking structures is is uh, definitely a, a best practice that a lot of uh, municipalities are moving towards. Um, one of them being the, the design consideration that was noted, so greener roofs, if I believe I heard correctly. Uh, so we, we'll definitely be including some guiding principles in the study that will will touch on these aspects. Uh, and uh, that being said, I did want to ask uh, Brampton if they have any existing plans for some of the, the current facilities that they have that we, we may not be aware of here at IBI. Anyone want to jump in? Sure, it's uh, it's uh, Richard, uh, Commissioner. But uh, yeah, absolutely, uh, there's, um, you know, the city um, has, uh, you know, uh, public lands and so on and so forth that we can certainly look at uh, how do we certainly with the, the sharing the co-sharing of the spaces you know we've got rec facilities that operate uh, during you know normal daytime hours and perhaps there's the use after you know the, the later hours of the period that uh, other uses could happen overnight uses and so on and so forth so absolutely we are happy to share that uh, theme. thank you commissioner so a couple more questions from the chat, and then as promised, we'll recap next steps and talk about where things go from here. So Attila, I think you can address this one. Somebody is asking, are you, is the IBI team using City of Brampton parking enforcement and ticketing data as part of your analysis? And they go on to say that if you're not, you should be. <laughs> but are, are you looking at that? Is that part of your work? Yeah, I can speak to that. Uh, yeah, we've been in touch with the uh, enforcement team at uh, the city of Brampton, and they'll uh, they, they'll be sending us the uh, locations and also the specific uh, parking violations that have occurred uh, that they've issued tickets for. So, yeah, definitely something we'll be uh, taking a look at and uh, hopefully gleaming some insights from that. Great. And there's a question about accessibility and active transportation. A number of times this evening, we've talked about this being a parking plan, not just for vehicles, but for, you know, no, not just for cars, but for trucks, for motorcycles, for 
bicycles and so forth. And someone is asking, will your plan touch upon accessibility and active transportation connections for private parking lots in particular? Um, and they've gone on to share some comments about that, but let me address or ask you to address that question. Go ahead, yeah, so th Thanks, Ben. And uh, that's a good question. Accessibility is, is always a hot topic when it, when it comes to parking. We definitely want to make sure that, uh, that, that all users are able to freely access parking and have sufficient space to unload and, and uh, access and egress to vehicles. Uh, a best practice has been to for, for municipal parking requirements uh, to, to adopt, um, sorry, let me take a step back, to, so to adopt zoning bylaw requirements that are in line with the requirements that are outlined by the Accessibility for Ontarians with uh, Disabilities Act. Uh, they provide uh, the, the requirements on a uh, that's for accessible parking requirements that are based on the overall number of parking spaces that are required by the zoning bylaws. So say 100 spaces are required, a certain proportion of those would need to be accessible parking. I believe they define two different types of accessible parking spaces as well. Uh, so, so that's been a best practice. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be looking at that as part of the comprehensive zoning bylaw review. We'll be, we'll be, uh, I know the city is currently updating their bylaws, but we'll be taking a look at that as well uh, on, a, on a policy level. Well, Glenn, it's, uh, it's Richard again, Commissioner, and we've got uh, both uh, Henrik uh, Zoberg and, and Nelson Cadet, who's been involved heavily with active transportation in Brampton have made, uh, and have led a number of significant um, uh, initiatives forward as it relates to active transportation and how this can tie into, obviously, the study. So I'm not sure if Nelson or, or, or Henrik wants to uh, jump in. Yeah, that'd be great to hear from both or either of them. Thank you, Richard. And I'll just note as well that the questioner, um, I believe it's Ty, was also talking about the importance of design guidelines and connectivity, connectivity between parking areas and transit and yeah, sidewalks so, and bus stops. So, those so are, yeah, those, yeah. Glenn, those are very those are very important questions, and and that's what uh, both Henrik and uh, and Nelson have been doing in terms of how do we make like how do we make our systems more connected so they're safer um, and they've been doing some uh, great work and certainly this council has uh, allocated the resources necessary to start to address some of these uh, issues of how do you make those connection points uh, work uh, so maybe Henrik or Nelson if you want to jump in yeah that'd be great thank you yeah, thanks, Richard. It's uh, it's Henrik here. If I miss anything, I'll throw it to Nelson, who is our active transportation project manager. But uh, I'll just start by saying that the the, the city we we have an active transportation master plan that was approved uh, in in 2019, and that we're um, hard at work implementing now. Um, that master plan includes provision not just for the the you know uh, cycling and, and pedestrian infrastructure, the linear infrastructure, but it also addresses uh, the, the 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 issue of, uh, of parking. And we're currently in the process of, uh, you know, through the comprehensive zoning bylaw about looking at those bicycle parking requirements for developments that would get incorporated through the, the, the site plan process. And, um, you know, but, you know, even before we do that, I mean, the all of the reviews that we're doing now with the guidance of that plan, um, Glenn, I think you had mentioned uh, the uh, the resident there had the comment about connectivity, um, parking lots to to bike parking. Uh, we so that's certainly something that we look at in these applications, um, as well as connectivity and, and, and safe access egress for for uh, cycling to the uh, the network that exists, you know, around these proposed developments. So it's certainly a front and center consideration, and um, with uh, the respect to the bike parking standards, um, there's a lot of guidance uh, out there uh, professionally as well. So um, we are certain we're, we're in the process of developing um, that kind of consistent guidance to provide uh, to the developers where we're basing it, I think, on input from the Association of uh, Pedestrians and Bicyclists. Uh, it's uh, um, a, a standard uh, that's that's been kind of well accepted and uh, universally applied. Um, so that is uh, it's ongoing work, and uh, I think with a lot of the new development that's out there, I think we can see uh, you know the, the the fruit of some of this uh, of these efforts. Um, when I think about the new hospital uh, uh, in, in in the downtown, I think we've got uh, an example of of those kinds of parking provisions that are that are certainly active transportation considerations are front of mind and not a, a back end addition to the work that we're doing now. 
Great. And Nelson, did you have anything to add? Thank you, Henrik. Hi, Glenn. No, thank you. That was a pretty thorough uh, explanation. I guess just going back uh, to what was said, I think it was Attila said it earlier as well. We are all also going through a comprehensive review of all of the parking requirements, including bicycle parking based on different land use types. So, you know, that residential, uh, those condominiums or the residential high rises along the shoppers world to retail, all of those similar to parking uh, rates, we're establishing them all for, for bicycle rates as well. Okay, thank you. So I know we're starting to bump up against eight o'clock, but I, I see Sylvia's raised, um, again, the person with the screen name, Sylvia has raised their hand. Sylvia, let me invite you in. If you could be really quick and brief though, go ahead whenever you're ready. Sure, yeah, yeah it, it is Sylvia. Um, most of the city staff know exactly who, Sylvia, who I am. Okay. Um, so this is actually about the parking study or the parking study requirements for uh, applications. There's been a structural failure with how parking and uh, trip generation has been studied in that I often find applications are using the numbers which are designed for um, entirely car oriented stuff where 95% of trips are to be reasonably expected by automobile. Uh, Brampton is in the unusual situation of being a godforsaken unwalkable hellscape with decent transit. So none of the numbers really match. So we might see trips that where there's a huge amount of transit trips that's comparable to like Portland and Seattle or and San Francisco, even parts of San Francisco even. And so those are currently just being subtracted from trips instead of um, actually being counted separately. And some of these applications are massive. There's a huge one by Queen and the Gore Road. And I did the numbers and the comparison between the uh, dense urban and the car oriented urban. The trip, the difference in peak trips was something like over 150 transit trips in the peak hour that simply were not being accounted for, which would require uh, four articulated buses and six million dollars which was entirely just not counted in it and it could have been relevant to the city talking about section 37 benefits it's like look the, the dcs don't cover this level of transit need and so you're gonna have to cough up a little bit so we can make sure that there's adequate transit service so when the residents move in they can actually use it just like you'd expect for water and sewer mains to all be in place instead of inadequate capacity when a development is done there's okay. a huge development at castlemore on north of castlemore between the gore road and uh clarkway that's coming to the meeting on monday and there's a huge it's greenfield and the majority of it is multi-family apartments and the trans there is grossly inadequate. The developers taking advantage of lower parking requirements, which are great, but the lack of transit service there is going to result in a catastrophe in terms of transportation planning if that stuff isn't put in place before people start moving in. And there's just been a lack of effort there. Okay, thank you, Sylvia. I appreciate again the comments. Um, Okay, one more question that's come through the chat, then we're going to wrap things up. So we'll go just a few minutes past eight. Um, somebody is asking, has the city or the panel considered a lane parking space along the curbside for electric scooters? Is that something that you're looking at? I, I believe this one ties into the, the previous question about active modes of transportation. So the the answer that was that was given to that one would would apply here as well, I, I believe. Uh, they typically actually electric scooters uh, share right away with uh, with with bicycles and other micro mobilities. Okay, thank you, Attila. So again, everybody, we're looking to wrap things up by about eight o'clock. So um, if I can, in you know, beg your indulgence for just a few more minutes, we won't be much longer. If you're able to hang with us, we will wrap up shortly. Just before we do, though, I wanted to invite uh, again Attila Hertel, if you've joined us in progress from IBI, to briefly reiterate next steps and remind everybody um, of how they can continue to be involved in the process. He'll then hand things to Malik Majid um, from the city to share some 
quick observations before he hands it back to me and then I will quickly draw things to a formal close. We won't take too much more of your time, um, but Attila, go ahead, please. Great, thanks, Lynn. Uh, so the, the immediate task is to wrap up the the phase one of the consultation. So the, the, one of the items was the engagement session that we just had. We have a few other uh, sources of feedback that are open, including the, the public survey that's, that's available. We're going to be wrapping up the future parking projections, the parking policy framework, uh, and then we're going, we're going to be starting the financial assessment, uh, developing the parking management plan, and then uh, in Q3, we'll be going back to the public to discuss the preliminary findings and uh, that will be used to finalize the, the study findings along with comments that we will hear from, from council and from the, the city's team and stakeholders as well. Uh, and yeah, that's that's essentially the, the roadmap for the next study. Please keep an eye on the project web or the study website to be a, keep abreast of upcoming en engagement activities. Great, and let's move to Malik now again, who's the project manager from the city of Brampton. Um, Malik, when you're done, hand things to me and I'll formally draw things to a close. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Glenn. <clears throat> so I just wanted to thank everyone for taking time away from their valuable evening engagement to participate in this project, uh, which is uh, very important for the sustainable development uh, of the city. Uh, the city has uh, put in significant effort uh, with regard to the public outreach for this project through social media, print media, uh, radio, and so on. So I would also urge you to spread the message uh, on social media so that more people uh, would continue to participate. Uh, I would encourage if anyone has not taken uh, completed those uh, surveys on the city's website to please do so and also share that link with uh, everyone else because these are all going to be very useful recognizing that uh, parking is the least studied aspect of uh, urban development so this is uh, very important stuff once again for the sustainable development of the city uh, again i want to thank everyone and uh, particularly thank richard for being here and providing leadership and with that, I will hand it over to Glenn. Great. Thanks, Malik. So I'll just take 30 more seconds of your time. First, I'll, I'll echo Malik and thank everyone again for participating. A special thank you to those of you who shared questions, who shared your answers to the team's questions, who shared your comments and observations, all very much appreciated. Um, from my perspective, it's been a real pleasure facilitating this session with what is obviously such a very thoughtful, knowledgeable, and articulate group. And I'll now formally adjourn the meeting and thank you to the various personnel who made this session possible, including our technical manager from the city of Brampton. And again, thank you all for your participation. Enjoy what's left in the rest of your uh, evening. Take care, um, keep safe, and so long for now, everyone.